Thanks a lot for that really warm welcome. I only have 15 minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to get right to it. Uh, it seems like everyone is talking, thinking, writing about microservices today. Me included, actually. And, but still, there's more confusion about what, what it means and how to deliver on it than ever. So t in, in this talk today, I'm, I'm going to take a look at, at, at microservices from, 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 from first principles and, and try to put it in its true context, distributed systems. So, truth to be told, I mean, we have, we as software develop developers have been spoiled by the once-believed almighty monolith and its single SQL database, you know, the holy SQL database for way too long. It's a fairy tale world where we, as developers, could assume strong consistency and that we were living in, like, you know, in a singularly globally consistent now. Where we could like comfortably forget about, you know, the, the university classes and distributed systems we took ages ago and just be fine with that. Well, knock, knock, who's there? Reality. We have been living in, in an illusion, far from reality. To, you know, today, applications are deployed from everything from you know, mo mobile devices, handheld devices, for, up to cl cloud computing architectures, um, running often like in total like thousands of multi-core processors, and, and users expect millisecond latency and close to 100% uptime which is actually quite a lot to ask, for, <laughs> ask to us as developers to, li to, li to live up to these things. And traditional architectures, so simply, I mean, tools, products, techniques, these things that we have learned, simply won't, simply won't cut it anymore. So I really, I mean, we can't make the horse faster, essentially, to, to like paraphrase Henry Ford. We need cars for where we're going. So it's, it's time to wake up. It's time to retire the monolith and to decompose our systems into manageable, discrete services that can be scaled individually, that can be upgraded, uh, rolled out, and failed in isolation without like, taking down the whole system. So asynchronous communication, isolation, autonomicity, single responsibility, exclusive state, and mobility. These are the core traits of reactive microservices as, as I see them. So, and today we're going to take a look at each one of these in a little, little bit more, in more detail see, like, and, and dive into what they really mean. It's really unfortunate that synchronous REST over HTTP is widely considered as the, sort of the go-to microservice co communication protocol. This, I mean, this synchronous, it, it's, it's, it's synchronous co coupling, a synchronous nature, it introduces strong coupling between services, which makes it a very bad default protocol for inter-service communication. Instead, I strongly believe that, that as a default, communication needs to, between services needs to be based on asynchronous message passing. And it's very important to have an asynchronous boundary between your two services, because you, 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 you need that in, 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 to truly decouple them and their communication flow in time, that gives you concurrency, and in space, that gives you mobility and distribution. So you have these two axes, right, and both that are enabled by, by having this asynchronous boundary between. Isolation is probably the most important trait, though. It's the foundation for, for many of the high-level benefits in, 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 micro, in microservices, but it's also the trait that has the biggest impact on your design and architecture. It will slice up your architecture like, vertically. It will imp impact the way you organize your, your teams and the responsibilities, just as Melvin Conway discovered in the 60s and was later turned into Conway's law. I'm sure most people here have heard, have heard about that. An isolation of failure, I mean, being able to contain and manage failure without having it to cascade across components and, and in the worst case, taking down your whole system, uh, sort of is a pattern that is often referred to as bulkheading. The so bulkheading has been used in the ship construction industry for, 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 for centuries as a way of dividing the ship into isolated watertight, watertight compartments. So if, if a few compartments are, rip, are ripped open and, and filled with water, the ship can, can, can still continue, continue to function and reach its, its, its destination. And resilience, that is the, the, the ability to heal from failure, not just to you know, take a hit and then eventually I mean, die, right, once you get too many hits, but actually recover fully 
from, from, from failure. And that requires com the, the, the compartmentalization, the isolation of failure that bulkheading can give us. And also that's sort of enabled by the asynchronous boundary that I, that, that, that I just talked about. Because you can only achieve full compartmentalization, full isolation by breaking free from the strong coupling that we have in, 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 in systems, and in particular the microservices-based systems, is that, that, that's the context here. The, the, the good news, though, is that we have a much more sort of refined foundation now for isolation of services, all the way down to the hardware, using you know, you know, vir virtualization, Docker, unikernels, and, and, and stuff like that. Isolation is also a prerequisite for autonomy and mobility, actually, and only when services are isolated, they can be fully autonomous. They take decisions independently, act independently, and cooperate and coordinate with others to, 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 to solve problems, which is really one of the biggest strengths of, 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 of microservices. Building like, services that are fully autonomous and, and that can act on their own and collaborate. I think the word microservices in general is a, really, is a, is a, is a, is a pretty terrible word because it implies size and it, and it makes people argue about what, how many lines of code should a service be and still be allowed to be called micro. I think we need to have stopped that, this madness. I mean, it's not, it's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with the intent. Instead, it's about really about one thing and one thing only. It's about scope of responsibility, adhering to the classic single responsibility principles, like if there are a lot of OO, I mean, OO uh, folks here, you know, we, th this is the way we, 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 we were taught to, be, to, to write good object-oriented programs for, year, pr programs for, free, for, for years. A service should really have only, should do one thing and one thing well. It's the Unix philosophy. A service should have one single reason to change. And if a service has one single reason to exist, providing a single composable piece of functionality, then, then business domains and, res and, and business responsibilities are not tangled, and which makes the code easier to like, both understand, sort of compose, extend, and maintain over time. Okay, but what about state? State is like the elephant in the room here. I, I think what's, what, what is really needed is each microservice takes sole responsibility of its own state and the persistence thereof. It needs to be seen as one thing. We, I mean, which, we, we, there's a lot of debate about which storage medium is the best. I mean, some love event sourcing. I, I mean, personally prefer that. Others like, still want to stick to the SQL database and so on. But that doesn't really matter. What matters is which, med which medium is used doesn't really matter. What matters is that each service Treats it as, a, as a, is treated as a single unit, including its behavior and state, okay? And it needs to own its state exclusively. Mobility is the, is the ability sort of to move services around at runtime while they are being used. And one requirement for this is that services are addressable addressable through virtual and stable addresses. I mean, addresses that always work. Even if, if the service is currently failing, if it's currently being relocated, moved around in the cluster for, for, for efficiency reasons, optimize the locality of reference, for example, or other things, or being currently upgraded, the address should always work. And for the client, it should be that nothing has changed. You should always be able to communicate with this address. And this is what is called location transparency. If you, if you read some of, the, some, some of the stuff I've been writing and other people are writing about reactive systems, you, then, then, then you have heard, probably heard the term, and it's because it's one of the cornerstones in reactive system design. And it's actually the opposite of transparent di distributed computing. It's actually assuming that the net, everything in the network, it's actually way it's, it's sort of explicit, and it's like fully embracing the constraints and the limitations of network programming instead of trying to hide it behind you know, leaky abstractions like done in, in synchronous RPC and stuff like that. <clears throat> it's also paramount that the service is seen and moved around as a single unit. This includes behavior and persistent state. This to stay completely oblivious, as a, uh, bo 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 like both as a, as a service as, and for, for, from a client perspective, stay oblivious to how the, how the system is deployed and which topology it currently has, something that will change dynamically as the system is being used. At least should, probably, depending on load and stuff like that. 
<clears throat> so now we have a pretty good understanding of what it means to, 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 and what characterizes a single individual microservice. However, one microservice is not of much use. They always come as systems. That is something that, that a lot of people forget. <clears throat> and, and just like humans, I mean, they act autonomously and therefore need to co communicate and collaborate with others to solve problems. And just as, as we humans as well, it is in the collaboration that, that m most of the interesting, challenging, both interesting opportunities and challenging problems arise. Like individual microservices are fairly easy to understand and to implement. What is hard is actually all the things around them. You know, things like discovery, coordination, security, replication, data consistency, failover, deployment, integration with other systems, legacy systems, etc. Just to name a few of them. So one of the main major benefits of microservices, though, is that it gives us a set of tools to exploit reality, to create systems that closely mimic how the world actually works, including all these constraints and opportunities. And, very, and one very subtle but extremely important thing to, em, to embrace and to understand is that reality is not consistent. There is no single absolute now, no single absolute present. Everything is relative, including time and our experience of now. <clears throat> and you know, <clears throat> sorry, information cannot travel faster than, than the speed of light and most often travels considerably slower. And this means that communication of information has latency. Information is always from the past. And now is always in the eye of the beholder. We're sort of always looking into the past. And understanding this fact can really be, can both be terrifying and also sort of liberating. Depends on how you look at it. <clears throat> but as soon as we exit the boundary of the microservice, we enter a wild ocean of non-determinism. That is the world of distributed systems. And this is the world where, where systems fail in the most spectacular and intricate, in, in and intricate ways, where information get, get, gets lost, reordered, garbled, and where failure detection is a guessing game. Okay? This might sound terrifying, but it's also the world that gives us solutions for a lot of hard, hard things, like resilience, elasticity, Isolation, true isolation, among, among other things. And here, <clears throat> micro, the, the, the individual microservice can be an escape route from reality, in a way. Within each microservice, we can live on a safe island of determinism and strong consistency, where we can assume that, that, the, that we, are in, you know, we are living in the only single globally now, global now, essentially, uh, and where we can live like happily under the illusion that the time and the present is absolute, even though it's not. And in order to do that, we need to fully embrace the constraints of distributed systems, which actually happens to be the constraints of reality. So strong consistency requires coordination, which is extremely expensive, especially in, in, in a distributed systems. In, in a distributed system, it puts an upper bound, a ceiling on scalability, throughput, low latency, and availability. <clears throat> and the need for coordination means that individual services can't make progress <clears throat> individually, but actually has to wait for others for consensus, which is also extremely costly. <coughs> Sorry. So when designing microservices, we should therefore strive to minimize the service-to-service -to -service communication and coordination of state. We should allow them to comfortably, comfortably share silence. And exploiting this fact, so, uh, so, so, so ex exploiting reality me, uh, means coming, coming sort of at peace with the fact that information is always from the past. It's always representing another present and than ours, another view of the world. Once again, we're always looking into the past. And to model this, we have to rely on, on eventual consistency. It might sound like we are giving up a lot by doing that, and we are. 
But as I said, again, it also raises the ceiling of what can be done in terms of loose coupling, you know, evolve the systems more rapidly, scalability, availability, and so on, as, as stated by the CAP theorem. So Grace Hopper once said it's, that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to, to, get, to get permission. So well, what can we learn from that? Well, if we can't coordinate and be certain about something, okay, well, what do we do? In real life, we usually just take an educated guess, a bet that the condition will hold, and if it doesn't, if we were wrong, then we apologize and we perform some sort of compensating action. This, 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 this approach works very well in computer systems as well, especially the distributed system. It really matches reality in, 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 in to a large degree. It's often how we humans operate all the time, really without thinking about it. So other examples, you know, are, are like airlines are usually overbooking flights. Way too many, many times I've been in that situation. And then they try to bribe themselves out of the problem by issuing, you know, airline vouchers, like, like 10 bucks for food or around the corner here or something. And, it's, and the same thing with ATMs. They allow you to withdraw money even, though, even if there's a network disconnect. And then later charging your account, possibly to a negative balance, and you have to sort that out later. The world is really not consistent, even though we th often think it is. So, but what about transactions? Don't we need transactions? I mean, we, we, most people here have grown up with transactions, you know, the legacy of Jim Gray and uh, all that stuff. Well, transactions are fine and should be used within an individual microservice, where we can assume strong consistency without having to pay much of the cost. But, 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 but to quote Pat Helland, I mean, in general, application developers simply do not implement large-scale distributed, large, dis so large scale, scalable applications assuming distributed transactions. So what do we do? Well, a practical, scalable, and resilient alternative to distributed transactions that, that actually makes use of some of the, of the techniques we, we just talked about here, compensating actions and stuff like that, is the saga pattern. It's a way of managing long-running business transactions. So, and it's sort of based on the idea that one long-running transaction sort of, sort of that, that spans multiple entities comprises of multiple like, transactional steps, okay? So in which the overall consistency uh, as a whole can, can, can sort of be, be achieved by grouping these individual transactions together into a large thing. And the technique is then, is then to pair each, each individual stage transaction with a, with a compensating, reversing transaction. So, so if, if one of the steps in the overall transaction fails, the whole transaction can be reversed in the reverse order, step by step. There are more techniques to, 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 to it than, than that, but that's, that's just one of them. So I have a lot more to say about, about the topic of reactive microservices. I only have 15 minutes here, but hopefully this has given you some food for thought. And if you're interested in learning more, I mean, I just wrote a sh short mini book on the topic for O'Reilly, and you can download it for free using that URL. So that's all I had. To sum things up then, blah, blah, microservices, blah, blah. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>